So, Renee, we edited and published the book, didn't we? Can you believe it? And of course, with 10 other wonderful scholars from South Africa, the Netherlands, the United States and, um, and Canada. And uh, what's interesting about this book is really that it, um, it illustrated how um, the University of the Free State went on a, on a transformation project and how that transformation project intersected with uh, student leadership development and creating uh, global learning spaces. And at that stage, um, we as a university initiated two specific programs. The one was the F1 Leadership for Change program, which was initiated in 2010. And the other one was the Global Leadership Summit that started in uh, 2012. It was That's a triennial correct. summit. And of course, these two um, programs together formed the Global Learning Project to develop transformational student leaders at the University of the Free State. So what's interesting about this project is that it started in 2010 until 2018. Uh, the last uh, GLS Global Le Le Leadership Summit was in 2018. Altogether 780 students partip participated in this program, 259 staff members, 109 institutions, across four continents. It was large. Goodness. Yeah. How did you get involved in this project? Well, that was very interesting. I started uh, working at the university on 1 July 2010 in the office of the dean with special projects. And within two weeks from that date, we had the first um, panel interviews with students. So I really was just emerged in, in the program it was the first ever of its kind. We um, were actually developing the systems and, and I really just became absorbed by the program. And uh, needless to say, it, 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 you know, it's very close to my heart. Um, I worked with it throughout. So, but um, a wonderful experience. And of course, you were really one of the center pins of this, of this project um, over all these years. Um, I only got involved in the project in 2011 when I accompanied a first year cohort to one of our overseas partners yes. uh, for a period. And then of course, the 2012 GLS and, and afterwards. But it was a wonderful experience. We learned a lot. And, um, and through this book, we want to open up a scholarly reflection about um, this journey and what we've learned and share it uh, with readers and with other institutions and the world. Yes. So the core question that we really focus on in this book is in what ways did the UFS's F1 Leadership for Change and Global Leadership Summit programs enhance student leadership development, especially within the context of higher education transformation through creating global learning spaces and in that regard we've subdivided or categorized uh, the content of this book into four parts. So in the first part um, we really aim to contextualize this book uh, theoretically. So that's uh, chapter one and two. In part two we, uh, we've tried to contextualize uh, this book but also this project historically and that uh, would comprise of chapters three and four in the third part, we provide different scholarly perspectives from, uh, from various scholars uh, all over the world and that uh, comprise of uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8 and addendum A. And then uh, part 4, uh, I then conclude with sort of a reflection of um, comparing what we started with, the theoretical and conceptual framework that we established in uh, part one, and compare it with the different perspectives raised in chapters three to eight. Mm -hmm. I do a comparison, uh, identify similarities and differences, and that enabled me in the last chapter to draw some generalizations, which I believe will be helpful to um, higher education institutions, scholars, administrators, and so on. Indeed. So before we jump into the book, um, what was one of the highlights for you in editing this book? Well, I think it gave us a wonderful opportunity to reflect uh, on these two programs over the span of almost 10 years. And it was especially um, interesting for me uh, to work with some of the students from these cohorts and um, 
to see what the value had been in their lives. And indeed, I think one of the wonderful aspects of this project is that we got to know many, many excellent student leaders, but also many staff members and colleagues from various other institutions across this world. Yes. So chapter one, as I've <coughs> indicated, is all about uh, contextualizing this edited volume um, theoretically and conceptually. And so in chapter one, uh, Dr. Tracy Mason Innes and I um, really established um, the, a theoretical framework um, uh, by looking at three aspects. The first aspect is the core concepts and principles with regards to student development, student development theory generally, uh, just highlighting core concepts in that regard. Secondly, we looked at different models of student leadership development as it currently um, is embodied in the um, body of literature. And then thirdly, uh, we looked at the theoretical underpinnings of global learning and global learning spaces. In chapter two, then uh, Professor Caroline Suransky then went on uh, specifically by focusing on uh, global learning, the concept global learning, uh, through the lens of higher education transformation specifically. And she touches, I think, brilliantly on concepts like globalization, internationalization, decolonization and the global local nexus uh, in terms of higher education transformation and, and, and I think what really stood out for me in chapter two is um, the importance of global and decolonial education and how that influences uh, student leadership development. So chapter one and two is really defining terms, defining concepts um, but also enabling the leader to put on theoretical lenses that, uh, that the reader can then use to sort of interrogate and make sense as they went on uh, to, the, to the other chapters of the book. Mm. Right, so we also said then that part two, the aim of that was to uh, contextualize this edited volume uh, historically. Yes. Um, thank you. So, uh, Professor Jonathan Janssen, distinguished professor from the University of Stellenbosch, authored this chapter, uh, and it was mainly looking at the rationale and the evidence for the study abroad out of rural South Africa. So, the goal of this chapter is to establish an understanding of the institutional context and transformational imperatives behind these two programs. Um, in this chapter, the former Vice Chancellor of the Free State uh, university reflects on the historical and conceptual underpinnings of these two programs. And I think the important question um, that he wanted to address was in what ways did the FLC and the GLS programs become part of the institutional strategy to restore the positive race relations on a divided campus after the notorious rights incident. So moving on to chapter four, uh, on the architecture and the involvement of these two programs between the, uh, a period of 2010 to 2018. Um, I wrote the chapter, as you mentioned earlier on, I've been um, centered in, in terms of coordinating the program, implementing, um, and it outlines the architecture and the building blocks of these programs as they developed, evolved, and changed over the period of time. Um, insights are providing, pr provided regarding the design, the structure and the content development uh, of these respective components and phases as they were shaped and refined uh, by adding new dimensions and also due to the feedback that we received throughout the program from evaluations of participants. So furthermore, the life histories of selected students from the UFS cohort represented from the different year groups are incorporated here and they portray their personal experiences and share their testimonies of how these programs um, and interventions impacted them and guided their signature pathways. And what I, what I really like about the second part of this book, chapters three and four, it, it makes the project human. Um, it illustrates uh, in chapter three, you know, why did we yes. embark as a university on this huge transformation project and what role did student leadership development play in all of this? And exactly. then also in chapter four, as you've indicated, it really illustrates the nuts and bolts 
of how the program worked from the beginning uh, to the end, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and uh, also bringing in the student voice. So, so um, I like specifically part yes. two because it makes this edited volume human, but also practical. practical. And I think the readers and also other institutions can, al can learn a lot from this honest reflection mm -hmm. about who we were and what mm -hmm. we did um, in that ti historical time period. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, it's, uh, so to speak, a, a, a guideline, a how-to, if you wanted to replicate such a type of program and what to look out for, what were the pitfalls and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. So moving over to the third part of this book, so, so that comprises really of a different scholarly perspectives from various scholars that wrote chapters. And so in chapter five, we then <coughs> start with uh, Giselle Bailey. Uh, she's uh, situated at the University of the Free State in our unit for institutional change and social justice. And I really find chapter five to be an honest and a critical reflection about the systemic aspects of the transformation yes. project um, of, uh, of the global leadership uh, program that we embarked on. Um, she, uh, she focused specifically on the systemic challenges um, that the project faced, but also that the project triggered in the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's really from a systemic holistic perspective, I think a very good analysis uh, about what, uh, what the program uh, triggered but also faced. <coughs> in Giselle's own words, uh, this chapter seeks to clear some of the underbrush cloaking and understanding of the F1 Leadership for Change and GLS uh, programs. And for me, the value of this chapter is really it, it highlights and it illustrates what are the challenges if you want to fuse a transformation project with student leadership development uh, mm -hmm. through creating global learning spaces. And so, um, so it's an it's a honest, um, uh, honest chapter, but a very good uh, critical reflection of, um, of what happened within the system at the university during that time. Yeah, I think bold and revealing. Yes. yes. So chapter six is a very interesting one, and it focuses on networks of leadership and social change. Authored by Professor Beverly Bell, Prof. David Bell, and Dr. Marianne Sarkis, from Massachusetts in the US. The chapter reflects upon social network trends and associated modes of leadership among students who participated in the FLC program. They used social network analysis, interviews and focus groups conducted with students across five years of the program, um, explaining the social capital formation and leadership trends that have evolved across and between students from two different UFS campuses. Bloemfontein campus and the Kokwa campus. The analysis uses bridging, bonding and networking modes of social capital and transformational servant and social justice leadership theories to describe and understand these trends. And I find um, that chapter as a very rigorous chapter uh, from social network analysis really illustrating the shifts that took place in the social networks of students and it's beautifully illustrated through the diagrams and images yes. in that chapter, the shifts that happened yes. during that, that period. I think it's a very good a scientific uh, rigorous chapter. Exactly, I think the, the vector graphs are um, really a very uh, descriptive way of showing how things shifted for these students. Absolutely. So in chapter seven, uh, Professor Frans Kamsteeg from the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam um, really um, tried to make sense of higher education transformation uh, through the lens of self-identity self narratives of students. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, um, Frans gathered uh, uh, or did some ethnographic field work between 2012 and 2016 uh, with students that came from the University of the Free State to the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam and um, he did a brilliant analysis of, of the data and in that regard very interesting he identified seven self-identity narratives um, uh, from the data and I'm just briefly going to mention it it's very interesting the first one is uh, the spiritual mediator Secondly, uh, the hesitant Afrikaner. Thirdly, uh, the critical outsider. 
Fourthly, uh, the English marginal. Next, the reflective politician. Um, next, the born leader. And then lastly, uh, the ambitious woman. Uh, isn't that beautiful? And I think what it illustrates to me is really just the diversity. It breaks yes. open the diversity in terms of the kind of student leaders that this uh, program produced. Yes. Um, that is very special to me also because I was actually the mentor for the group uh, that visited um, uh, Frey University in 2014. And some of those personalities um, I can actually identify with in terms of students that were there. Um, and I think it's an excellent way of, of portraying, you know, um, the dynamics that played out in terms of leadership. So, Renee, um, chapters 8 and the addendum, addendum A, really sort of forms a, a unit of staff members from other universities yes. that partnered with us <coughs> and that really wrote a, a very good reflection of the personal experiences, the experiences of their students and what it really meant uh, for them to participate in this program. Yes. So chapter eight uh, was authored by Dr. Regina N. Williams from Montgomery College, um, also a museum scholar and a life member of the Oral History Association. And she was formerly um, a lecturer at Cleveland State University um, and she hosted delegations from the University of the Free State in 2011 and 2013. Um, I was also one of the mentors there in 2011 so the students that she uh, interviewed I, I met personally. Um, so she focuses on race, religion and reconciliation with an emphasis on academic initiatives, leadership development and social change. Um, she had first-hand experience working with American and South African students who really accepted the challenges associated with becoming change agents on their campuses, in their local communities, and in their countries. In every instance, uh, program participants were invited to listen, to read, to reflect upon, to discuss and write about the ideas of such leaders as the Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu and others, especially as these ideas related to the legacies of institutionalized racism and the need for truthfulness, forgiveness, and reconciliation in the 21st century. Um, she gathered evidence by interviewing former students about the experiences and the impact of ideas mentioned above of their current work um, and worldviews. Ultimately, this study seeks to understand how a consideration of ideas that are rooted in or related to religious and other spiritual traditions might enhance or hinder the development of student leadership and post-secondary learning in secular societies. Indeed, a very interesting chapter. Yes, absolutely. So the addendum uh, focused on the international partners' experiences and observations, um, a reflection from the Edmonds College um, in Washington, US, and the author is Marissa Dubois. Um, the chapter focuses on the reciprocal um, exchange aspect of the FLC and the GLS programs, uh, and is specifically at a suburban community college outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, she welcomed two student groups in 2013 and 2016 for a two-week immersion program which highlighted both student and campus diversity as well as unique aspects of the local community. As the UFS students experienced new thoughts and ideas, so did the students and staff at Edmonds Community College. By listening to diverging viewpoints and understanding the lived experience of others, Participants forge newfound connections, empathy, and lifetime friendships. And I must say, um, she's one of the people who really um, took to heart what this program meant for herself personally and her students, and um, illustrated how life-changing it had been for her. Yes, absolutely, and one can pick that up when you read the chapter. Exactly. You know, that, um, you know she's, she was really passionate about this project exactly. and it really meant a lot for her 
and for the students that participated. Yes. So the last part of the book, part four, um, uh, then is really um, made up out of um, chapter nine. And in that regard, um, I've really tried to, to compare um, the theoretical frameworks that we've established um, at the beginning in chapters one and two, the conceptual frameworks, and compare that with the different perspectives raised uh, between chapters three to eight. And, um, and in that regard, I've really tried to identify similarities and differences. And, um, and I, I used the categories, I, I remained with the categories of the uh, basic theoretical concepts of student development. Firstly, secondly, the models for student leadership mm -hmm. development. And then thirdly, uh, the theoretical underpinnings of uh, global learning um, in order to enable uh, the, the comparison. And in that regard, that enabled me then to identify three generalized themes that, that really came out. And I think that's where the scholarly contribution of the edited volume um, lies um, in terms of making a unique contribution mm -hmm. as an integrated collective whole edited volume um, uh, towards um, the field of higher education studies. So I'm just going to quickly uh, focus on those uh, three themes that really came out. So the first theme is leadership and a complex context. Leadership and a complex context. And what really became evident for us in this edited volume is that one of the attributes that students must attain through a program like this is the ability to work in a complex world. And uh, what was interesting, it seemed to us that in the current body of literature, um, it's not that evident um, that students must, student leaders must actually develop this ability to work in a complex world. It's implied, but it's not explicit enough. That's what we found. And I think that's something that really came out of this project, uh, the ability to work with complexity. Uh, the program in itself, because it was so large, mm -hmm. uh, in itself contained a lot of complexity. Mm -hmm. And students had to learn to deal with uh, with complexities, uh, because transformation is complex. And, um, and students, student leaders that were developed through this project had to learn how to deal uh, with complexity. So that was one of the things that, that got highlighted. Also under that theme, um, uh, became evident the need to, to balance the global and the local nexus, that interplay between the global and the local. And I think that's something that, that institutions can learn from us, is that um, it's good to have a good uh, global learning project, but it's important to uh, create that intersect with local challenges and to be locally relevant. And that's uh, something that came out very strongly in that theme. The second theme um, is uh, the systemic nature of change, global learning and student leadership. The systemic nature of change, global learning and student leadership. And that really highlights the fact that higher education transformation is systemic. Mm. A lot of social systems that are influencing one another. And that uh, what we found in the literature, there are uh, a number of examples of uh, global learning projects. I think what made the UFS project unique is that it added a layer of transformation. Yeah. So it sort of focused on, on three levels, on personal transformation uh, through global learning, uh, institutional transformation, in other words, how to use transform transformational student leaders uh, to transform the institution, mm -hmm and to tackle the challenges of the institution, and then how to use that to transform society, yes. uh, the, the um, challenges that, um, that are facing us as a society, especially in South Africa. And that three-pronged approach, I think, really made um, this, this um, edited, or this project rather, and, and the scholarly reflections of this edited volume uh, very unique. I think that those added layers uh, provide uh, deep insight mm -hmm. about uh, higher education transformation. But I also think it, it um, highlights a warning, and that is that if institutions consider to use um, global learning 
um, as a way to develop student leaders and you couple those initiatives with higher education transformation, the systemic nature of change will inevitably uh, influence the leadership development yes. program. And, um, and in that regard, um, higher education administrators and institutions uh, have to uh, reflect very carefully and consider very carefully if they want to couple big and significant programs with, uh, with the transformation, transformation of institutions. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the last theme that came out is a global learning in developing countries. Global learning in developing countries. I think what made this project very unique, and it's evident in the edited volume, is that it was initiated and driven from the global south. Yes. Um, we initiated it mm -hmm. and, and we were the leaders and we built strong partnerships with institutions in the global north. And that in itself, I think, made the project unique and um, makes the scholarly reflections of this edited volume very, very unique. Um, it also illustrates this reciprocal benefit that our partner institutions in the global north also received from, uh, from this project. Um, but it also opens up the challenges um, for institutions in the global south that oftentimes have to drive programs from a resource strained environment. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, it opens up very practically what to do and what not to do, do if you want to initiate a large uh, global learning project like this from the global south. So the Rene, why should people read this book? <laughs> Well, I think uh, you, you summarized it very well, actually, in, in that last chapter, but um, we attempted and I think we, we managed in, in this uh, book collection um, to give a, a, a view of what had taken place over 10 years. Um, what were the difficulties? How did we adapt? Uh, what were the influences? Um, how did the institution shift and change um, and, and how our students were impacted. So yeah, I think uh, one of the important things is the personal transformation of the students and how it influences transformation of higher education institutions, as you, you mentioned in that last chapter. And also the reciprocal effect uh, when collaborating um, with different countries in the world on global learning initiatives. Um, but I think for me, the, the, the main feature is the personal significance for all students and staff, uh, whether they were at the University of the Free State or abroad in, in those different um, institutions. Um, and we hope that it will unlock new commitment to the learning development and success of the student generation. Absolutely, and my hope is, is that um, you know, as people read this book that um, it will enable them to journey with us uh, mm -hmm. yet again mm -hmm. through the transformation process that we went through as a university uh, together with many other partners across the world. Um, uh, we are so thankful for their contribution also to, um, to the transformation of our institution and the growth and development. Um, of our students and, and many other students, we believe. So hopefully this edited volume will enable many readers to journey with us uh, through, uh, through this historical, very significant historical period at the University mm -hmm. of the Free State and that the scholarly reflections in this edited volume will enable them also to make sense and make meaning yes. out of our experience, learn from that and hopefully it can also enhance um, the development of student leaders also exactly. at other institutions. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful um, privilege to have been part of this program and uh, I'm grateful that we could conclude it in this fashion with this book. Thank you, Renee. Thank you.